Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, so this is just a quick flash that lots of people uh, have worked with us uh, on the kinds of research we do. And I would say 80% of what we do, uh, there's, let me start differently. So we used to have the Swiss Army knife as our symbol for a mind which has many different functionally specialized mechanisms. And our students with disgust sort of pointed out that the uh, smartphone, which came along after we'd been in business for 20 years, was actually a much better model. And the point, the point is, uh, as Lida said, is that, and it's a very counterintuitive notion, is that as part of our standard reliably developing equipment, there's lots of specialized <clears throat> neural programs which uh, cause us to interpret things in certain ways, to feel certain sets of preferences uh, in, in response to certain kinds of cues. And there is learning and there's construction and there's especially uh, arranging these things together in sets. But it's not the old fashioned model of everything is rationality or intelligence or cultural learning is in I, my biased opinion, decisively falsified. And we're getting a lot of new information about what human nature is and uh, how social <coughs> phenomena are structured by understanding the code, the actual, you know, what happens to information that's received by the human mind. It goes to one or more of these programs and it's and that, that then operate on certain ways. And that creates, uh, you know, triggers various motivations or certain interpretations of what's happening and so on. So uh, these are now, so I would say about 80% of the things we've studied bear on this question of politics uh, and morality as uh, Jonathan has uh, uh, done a uh, marvelous job of discussing uh, and illuminating. Uh, anyway, um, okay. So, uh, and this is in the premise of the, I still have to stop and talk about it because as an individual human being uh, who started out a socialist on the left, and uh, I am just flabbergasted how impervious the world I live in, the university world, and the larger world of politics is to the, you know, oceans of data about the relative performance of free markets versus uh, socialist systems. So that just pick one thing is that, you know, Hong Kong's uh, GDP increased 180 times between 1961 and 1999. The, the per person GDP rose by 87 times, right? These are huge, stupendous numbers, right? And you get, uh, you know, uh, if you contrast uh, market societies with the, you know, existing socialist societies, uh, not pseudo-socialist societies like Scandinavians where the actual economic markets work uh, pretty much like here. It's just the amount of redistribution is different. Um, anyway, or you take something like Venezuela, um, which has the largest petroleum reserves in the world, and petroleum products are now scarce in Venezuela. Uh, that uh, Nobel laureate Joseph Stieglitz predicted success of the of the Chavez and his new turn for Venezuela. And uh, you know, in the years that followed, oil production collapsed. There are now energy blackouts on a daily basis, two day work weeks, so we don't use too much energy. Food riots, forced labor. Okay. And, uh, and not only is that just the latest example of what happens, but also I'm fascinated by what Joseph Stieglitz, why he thinks what he thinks, because he's a smart guy, right? Um, and so there, there's some uh, strong sets of appeals for disregarding these mountains of evidence, right? Um, I, I would say empirically, there's not much of a case. And, uh, uh, but people don't pay attention. So there's something else going on. Um, and so the proposal is that the code, the program structure and certain of our evolved social and non-social instincts, and I'll only be able to talk about, you know, four things out of, you know, a hundred, uh, can be activated in certain configurations that make socialism seem appealing and freedom sinister. Uh, and, uh, okay. So I'm not arguing that our evolved psychology dooms us inevitably to end up in the socialist states, right? Uh, it's possible, but I don't think that's really the argument. Uh, 
And I just look at my own history where, you know, I was on the left and then I took microeconomics and wow, that was very impressive. In, despite the fact that the microeconomics class was full of propaganda advising you not to take this stuff so seriously. There's no pure competitive markets. There's, you know, uh, breakfast cereals are uh, monopolies because they artificially differentiate them so they can get a monopoly between, you know, post toasties and, and sugar uh, flakes and so on. Uh, and this was at Harvard and they were really intense that you not, in fact, be impressed by microeconomics. Um, anyway, uh, so the point is that uh, these of all programs could be woven together in our minds combinatorially to reinforce or undermine various political projects, right? Uh, ideologies, political movements, economic regimes. Uh, and uh, there's lots of these things. So lots of things are attractors that humans end up in. So predatory, hierarchical, uh, hereditary often, uh, exploitive systems are really a human norm. Uh, and uh, then group-based supremacist systems break out, you know, in Japan and Germany and uh, uh, communism was, and we're now facing uh, Islamic supremacism. Uh, uh, there's, there is, in independent places, the emergence of, you know, what you might call decentralized common law market systems. Those happen more rarely, but they do spontaneously emerge. Uh, and, of course, socialist systems. Uh, and so... Uh, what I would argue uh, is that you might analyze this as that there's the first thing is based on our low level aesthetic responses to certain social interactions and situations, there's a, it evokes a sort of sympathy for what you might call so, uh, romantic socialism. Okay? And that that's, you know, for individuals, it's a sort of attractor. It's a world you can imagine yourself living in. I mean, and, and, what your, would your personal life uh, be like under socialism? And that this arises from what ancestral band life was like, uh, some aspects of it. Um, and that there's a second powerful thing, and I don't want to just say it's all the first thing, but that in fact, the second thing is that there's a, a percentage of every population that's power seeking. And that socialism is extremely attractive because it says that the present holders of property uh, whether they have lots of property or only a little bit of property, that that's an arbitrary system that should be, that, and, it, and there should be an elite that makes decisions about, you know, the most basic economic uh, arrangements. And that's incredibly intoxicating, right? Um, and intellectuals like me, you know, we're against uh, free markets. And why are we against free markets despite the data? Uh, well, Markets make intellectuals irrelevant, right? That we we have high we have high high opinion of ourselves, right? We ought to be in charge. We're the, we're, we we specialize in rationality, right? And yet somehow it's all self-executing in a way which doesn't uh, cast good light on us, right? Okay. So there's this huge bias among uh, intellectuals uh, about why things spontaneous order is in fact uh, terrible in all sorts of ways. And, and it's the basic industry of, you know, social science, university life is a slight overstatement, but is producing critiques, right? Um, and uh, anyway, so for this category of people, not just intellectuals, there's then the real power seekers who displace intellectuals after a while uh, in, in successful movements, is what do you feel entitled to do against others to implement socialism where you're an elite? And so the uh, power seekers, group B, exploit phenomenon A, or, or the sort of, you know, the, the nice undergraduate imagining how nice the world, socialist world would be, okay? Um, and it involves the activation of one of the most powerful systems of instincts humans have, which is a coalitional psychology, group phenomena, right, okay? Uh, but first, before I talk about that, if I will have time, uh, 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 I just want to talk first about romantic socialism and just to give you a feeling of, uh, and Lee just covered some of this. So, so we evolved in bands that were the individual's only protection from starvation, victimization, and intergroup aggression, right? So you didn't have supermarkets, you didn't have police, 
if you were in trouble, the only people you could go to were the, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 adults in your community, right? And that was it. Um, and everybody, so we have data on this from various field sites, and there's also lots of evidence, osteolo uh, bone evidence from bones about rates of injuries and so on. But, you know, everybody sooner or later is uh, uh, injured in such a way uh, that they are prevented from gathering food for a long, you know, for weeks, okay? If you're a chimpanzee, so uh, you die if that's the case because nobody brings you food, right? And that's a pretty chilly world, right? Humans are much nicer than that, but humans in your group, right? So it, we, we evolved not as individuals foraging as individuals, that humans are uh, ob uh, obligatorily group living animals who have many, are really fine textured adaptations, including uh, things which give rise to various moral uh, phenomena, but uh, also just co various types of cooperation and basic level emotions deal with the fact that we need to manage our social world such that people care about us um, and uh, care about us enough to protect us, to feed us when we get into trouble. Um, and one of the ways that, that's, so, you know, as Lita was talking about with the risk pooling, is there's a nice simple sort of cue input that spontaneously activates this desire to share, okay? Uh, but beyond that, uh, uh, there's the following desperately important game for ancestors, uh, which is that uh, uh, if somebody's being nice to you, they could be nice to you because they care about you, or they could be nice to you because they have an ulterior motive. You're temporarily high status, or you might give them something or something. And it's very, so, and you as a human, uh, ancestrally as a human being, you had a finite number of social niches. You know, very small number, like, you know, six or seven or eight close friends or something like that, or a smaller set. And if you put a fair weather friend in there, somebody who's nice to you, seems perfectly nice to you, but when the going gets tough, they abandon you, okay? Then that's a big fitness problem for you. It's a big survival problem for you, okay? And so the mind is desperately interested in people's motives for why they like you and to do this discrimination task because it's an error to, to so uh, I've forgotten his name, uh, no, but a rapper who had hundreds of people in his house and he had lived a very good life for 10 years and then he went bankrupt because he spent it all on his friends and then he just lives alone, right? Um, so that's that kind of error. Um, uh, okay, and so, so one of the things the mind looks for is it looks for the following signal. Does this person trade off their own welfare for our wealth, for, for your wealth, for my welfare at, at any given time, okay? And that's a sign that they're not just in it for themselves, that they actually legitimately care. Uh, and we, talk, we have a paper called The Banker's Paradox. It's not really a paradox. But anyways, the, what people say about bankers is that when you need a loan, uh, you're a bad credit risk and you can't get one. And when you don't need a loan and you're doing well, bankers want to give you money, right? And say, for the hunter-gatherer, it's the same kind of situation. When you are in trouble, uh, you're a bad credit risk to the people around you, right? You're a much less good bet than when you're doing fine. And so the thing you need to do is to move in the social world in such a way as to cultivate a kind of valued, irreplaceable individuality inside your social group, okay? So, uh, the mind filters the world with this kind of thing. So this is another, uh, uh, the mind filters the world for people who treat you with some special affection and interest, right? And that's the most important thing to you, right? To people, it's a very major part of people's happiness and so on. Uh, and the, uh, but in contrast, the vast market-based economic systems exploit for their amazing productivity a very different cognitive system which has evolved to handle explicit contingent exchange. And we spent a lot of time studying the reasoning specializations involved in it. But the point about that is that you're looking at whether you get something that's worthwhile to you in your exchange, okay? And you're not, uh, it's not, you're not detecting people who are sacrificing for your welfare, right? And so every time you engage in a normal uh, market transaction, for a hunter-gatherer, that's a sign of social distance because 
they don't, you know, when, is, so, and this is true for us too in our personal lives. So if you go into somebody's, uh, they're invited over for dinner, uh, and you say, well, gee, I'll pay you 10 bucks for the biggest steak, but I expect a rebate on the lima beans, right? Uh, you'd be seen to be defective or barking mad, and, you know, I cringe at the thought of saying something like that. That's not how we deal with our friends, right? And so there's this tension or difference between uh, people who, who insist on an explicit payback in, for what they're due for you. Those are people who are not part of your immediate circle, right? And so, so ancestrally, most of our production, most of our sharing, most of the exchange went by a very different set of rules that were from people you were really close to, right? And then we had, in addition, this ability that evolved for more distant social relations and explicit contingent exchange. And in the modern market world, that one thing, because it's so uh, productive, has eaten up most of how people uh, get their living. And, uh, and so it's displaced uh, the thing which would make, which we're designed to expect is a sign of a good world. A good world is one where you're surrounded by people who care, who care about you. Um, and so it's, it's really interesting. So, so some of these psychological mechanisms, they tend to terminate in their effects for a, sh for a short distance, like, you know, uh, a mating relationship. It's two people, generally. And, uh, or a friendship could include more people, but it's still very short, uh, short scale. But so lots of chemistry is like that. It's just molecules are short and small. But carbon chains can be really, really, really long. So uh, it amazes me, even though I teach this, taught this for 30 years, that you know, your chromosome, single molecule, is a single giant molecule about five centimeters long. So you can see it with the naked eye, right? And that's just almost all the molecules are, you know, uh, Avogadro's number is incredibly big, right? It's all the things in normal chemical world is very, are very small. Similarly, the thing about ex explicit contingent exchange is that it can be extend into indefinitely large chains. In fact, now it's it's global, right? And so so that 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 there's this thing which its massive productivity and efficiency makes it huge, and yet it doesn't. Uh, it, it gives this these living that way gives some warning signs or some dissatisfaction that the, something's wrong with the world, um, and. Uh, uh, Okay, so then uh, another thing to talk about here is that uh, uh, another common kind of social interaction or behavior for our ancestors and for us is to move together in a coalition to attempt to achieve some common end. And a very important uh, uh, subset of this is, uh, is warfare and a very related uh, subset is political alliance within a group, right? Factions and so on. Uh, and so I've always liked uh, James Madison's line that the causes of faction are sown in the nature of man, right? So he's, I think of the Constitution as act actually a, a, a set of engineering on evolutionary psychology 1.0, right? And then, because uh, they really read deeply in terms of what people were really like and they, the, and how things failed and how things succeeded. And it was very careful and thoughtful. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, so it's really a problem to move as a group, okay? Because there's always interest in individuals in uh, defecting and so on. So it's a very rare phenomenon among other species. And uh, whereas chimpanzees and humans formed, have cracked this code of how to be a coalition. And that means you can win in uh, dominance contests and in aggression. If your group is larger than the other group, then you can displace and you can get access to. Uh, so is this one minute to the five more words? Okay. Um, okay. So coal and and in the in the side the coalition. So to move as a group, uh, there it has to be a goal which people are is not always, but in general, mutually beneficial for the members of the group. And the benefits have to be distributed in some way. There are distortions which come from hierarchies inside groups and so on, and they're non-trivial. But still, there's this underlying kind of socialist thing. You see public goods, uh, and uh, 
so there, the, 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 the basic logic of collective action is rooted in how people move and think in terms of groups. So it, it's like very hard to inhale. So if you're, so for example, if the organizing system for your group is a set of ideas, right? Then you can't, then there's this real tension which makes groups much more stupid than individuals, which is that if I wanted to innovate, if I thought had a thought that, oh, this is better than what the normal group thinking about this is, that makes you a bad group member because you're now attacking the group's coalitional flags, right? And so, uh, uh, so that's why we have like, you know, uh, Jonathan has this, formed this wonderful organization, the Heterodox Academy, but on universities, there is this real heated anger at people who are who violent, who just want to think a little bit creatively or alternatively about some of the problems, okay? Because that makes you a bad group member in the coalition, right? Um, and uh, uh, the other thing which, uh, 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 I just want to throw out there, Any, anyway, so, you show you're a good coalition member by sacrificing your individual effort for group ends. Um, and there should be some sharing of the cooperation. But, the, but, but there, here's one thing about individual cooperation versus group level cooperation. With individual cooperation, if somebody cheats me, there's a really simple cure for that. I don't interact with them. I don't, I don't exchange with them again because they've shown that that's not a, pay, a paying strategy. And that, that works great. So people, we have work on cheater detection and you know, termination of relationships and so on, okay. In a group, if lots of people are, are contributing to the group and one person is not, you can't withdraw from the exchange, the end person exchange, right? Because then you're giving up all these good cooperators as well as the bad cooperator. And the, the, the sort of evolved resolution of that is that the mind identifies, uh, it develops, it, we've evolved a punitive sentiment towards people who are not, in our minds, doing their share for the good of the group, right? And so people are positively disliked. So for intellectual disagreement, they're po it's a source of positive dislike. And especially, I want to say, in, in uh, socialist and especially communist countries, the way that people experience this is if you are not, you know, the, there's a perpetual war on, uh, there's this punitive sentiment which is free flowing. And so the fact that there are gulags and things like that, it's a natural kind of evoked cultural response to being in, in productive groups where people are not producing as much as they ought or things aren't going well. And since the ideology can't be wrong, if things are not going well, it must be individual misbehavior. And we have to find those individuals, the kulaks or whoever they are, and we have to really punish them in order to retain this really good romantic future. Okay. Um, and uh, one minute. Okay, great. So I can just say another really important thing here, and this is to be a closing point, is that uh, zero sum thinking is so. Uh, Exchange is positive sum. We engage in them is because I get something and the other person gets something. We're both better off, right? Um, but if your worldview is zero sum, uh, then uh, something that somebody else gets is means it was taken from you or your group, right? And so it's a very it's a very uh, uh, unpleasant way of experiencing the world, and it motivates things like envy. And the desire. So we have research on uh, motivations for uh, supporting welfare, and there's compassion, but there's also envy is a significant feature that people are willing to make poor people worse off in order to make rich people worse off, right? And uh, because they don't like the fact that rich people are better off than they are, right? Uh, and so, uh, and groups by their nature ancestrally were zero sum because they were largely involved in territory displacement and things like that. So I think I'll end there and uh, great, thank you.